Hello everyone! Today in this GoTo tutorial we're gonna see how to set up a basic point-and-click navigation system for an RTS kind of game. At the end of the video we will have this little scene with a ship that we can control by right-clicking on the ground to set its target position. The path to the position will be computed with GoTo's 3.5 and plus navigation utilities. As usual, don't forget that you can also get all the assets in the scene and the scripts that we we'll make in the video in the GitHub repo with all my Godos tutorials. And with all that said, let's get to it and discover how to implement this basic navigation system, starting with the click logic. Okay, to begin with, let's see how to react to right mouse clicks on the ground. Our goal here will be to monitor input events, and if we get one that matches a right mouse click, convert the position of our cursor on the screen to a world position on the ground using a raycast. Then we'll show a little target location asset to check the position is properly retrieved and to give players some feedback. To do all of this, we'll need a few things. First, in our scene, we have to make sure that our ground has some collision shaped child node in order for Raycast to be able to hit it. In my project, I've prepared a basic hierarchy with a static body node under my ground mesh and then a collision shape with a box shape that matches the size of my basic cube primitive mesh. The next thing we're gonna need is a camera to cast our mouse click ray from. Again, I've already added one to my scene over here and in my case, I've set it to use the orthographic mode because I want to get this top view strategy feel for my game. Last but not least, we need to create a new c script to code up our logic in. I'll name it Game Manager because it's going to handle stuff that is global to the whole scene, and I'll drag it on the root node of my scene. Now let's clean up the startup snippet and make sure that we change the parent class our Game Manager inherits from, from the default node c class to the spatial class, matching the type of our root node in the hierarchy. That's important because later on it will allow us to access the world space state to perform our raycast in. For now, we'll keep things simple and see how to capture a mouse right click event. To monitor events in Godot, we can override the node's built in underscore input function, which receives the current event as a parameter. This event can be of many types it can be a mouse button press, or a release, or a keyboard interaction, etc. So, the first step is to ensure the event we received is of interest to us by checking its type. In c -sharp, we can do that with pattern matching using an is expression like this. So, this line basically means that if my initial at event variable can be casted to an input event mouse button, the check returns true and the cast version is stored in this new local variable, event mouse button. Now we can do some additional verifications on this event mouse button variable, like if the button was pressed or released, and if it was the right mouse button. If all of this is true, then the player has just done a right click, and we'll print a little log to show it. If we run our project now, we see that as soon as we right click anywhere on the screen, we get a print in our Godot console with our message. So we've successfully managed to catch a right click event. The next step is to do our recasting with a ray that starts from the position of a mouse on the screen and goes straight ahead according to the camera's projection logic. As explained in the Godot docs, the engine provides us with some nice utilities to abstract away the differences between perspective and orthographic projections. Therefore, all we have to do is use the project ray origin and project ray normal methods of our camera node to compute our ray. So let's start by referencing our camera node. I'll cache the reference in my game manager class and assign it in the ready function based on its path in the hierarchy. Then, in our right click logic, we'll call the project ray origin and project ray normal based on the event mouse button dot position, which is the position of the cursor in 2D screen coordinates. This will give us the origin and the direction of our ray, which we can easily combine together to also get the endpoint of the ray. This value of 1000 is an arbitrary length for the ray that you can of course adjust depending on the dimensions of your scene. Now that we have a ray, we need a space to do the ray casting in. To get this, we we'll use the getWorld method that is available for any spatial node and then extract the direct space state from it. This state has an intersect ray method that takes in the origin and endpoints of the ray and computes all the intersections with elements in the scene that have a collision shape. 
The results are stored as a dictionary, so to know if we've gotten any hits, we can check that this intersection variable contains at least one element. If it does, then it means that we've just clicked on something. The only problem is that, for now, we can't be sure it's really the ground. Because if you look at the hierarchy of my demo scene in the GitHub repo, you'll see that there are other objects in the scene with a collision shape, so those could totally trigger a raycast match as well. To optimize the search and limit it to just the ground, we can use Godot's system of layers and masks. I actually already talked about this in a previous tutorial I made on how to make a basic tower defense to the game in Godot C Sharp, and in a nutshell, the idea is to assign your collision shapes or bodies to specific layers, and then use the corresponding masks to filter just those objects when you check for a collision, the entry in an area, or a raycast, for example. In our case, let's say we go to our ground's static body child and change its layer from the default value of 1 to 2. Then in our script, we're going to define this mask value in a constant integer variable, and down where we do the raycast, we'll add some parameters to our intersect ray call to pass in the mask at the end. The third parameter in the middle is the list of objects to exclude from the intersection checks, which here we can leave empty. Now, thanks to this mask, we are sure that if we get an intersection, it's with an object on layer 2. And since our ground is the only one that is on that layer, it must be that we clicked on the ground somewhere. The only thing left to do is getting the world's position matching this click, which is the position of the intersection that we can get like this. To actually see our result, we're going to make a reference to the unit target location subscene I prepared in the project, and I've added to this main scene, which will show the nice animated visual of a location marker on the ground. I'll create a variable in my game manager of type unit target location to get the C -sharp script on my node, fill it in the ready function, and then in the raycasting logic where we extract the position, I'll just call my click function on the unit target location script instance with this position. The function simply places the object in the right place and starts the little circle spread animation. So if we restart the game, we see that now, when we right-click on the ground, our nice marker instantly jumps to this position and runs its animation. So it's pretty cool, we can now easily point and click on our terrain to specify a target position. Now what we want is to actually use this location as a target for our little ship and have it move across the map to reach it. Except we don't want it to just go in a straight line. Rather, we're going to use Godot's navigation tools to compute a clever path that avoids the obstacles on the way. Implementing a robust navigation system is never easy, and yet it's something that is so essential to so many games that game engines have to have some sort of built-in feature for that. So over the years, Godot has improved its navigation system in many ways, and with Godot 3.5, they refactored some things and significantly improved the tool to make it fairly easy to have agents move on a map and auto-compute intelligent paths based on walkable and non-walkable areas. To use this navigation system, the idea is the following. First, you'll need to define the surface of your terrain, the surface that the agents can walk on. This is called the navigation mesh, and it's done by adding a navigation mesh instance node to your scene, and then creating and configuring a navigation mesh resource inside. In my case, I'm going to convert this terrain spatial node into a navigation mesh instance node, and then in the inspector, create and link a new nav mesh instance. Now, to set up this navigation mesh, you'll want to tell Godot how to use the geometry inside your scene to generate the nav mesh. This mainly means specifying two things. First, what type of objects should Godot look up to build its mesh? Just mesh shapes, just static colliders, or both? In my case, I'll choose the static colliders because I've made sure to give static body nodes with collision shapes to all the obstacles in my scene, plus my ground, of course, and because I find it easier to control the margin around the obstacles with this setup. The second point is giving Godot the exact subset of objects to pass for the nav mesh. By default, it will look at the child hierarchy of the navigation mesh instance, but you can also specify a custom set of objects by using Godot's groups, and having the navigation mesh look for just the nodes with this group name. Here I'll use this feature, 
and keep the default navmesh group name for the objects to consider in the computation. Then I'll give this group name to my ground node and to my props node, which is the parent of all the obstacles in the scene. And finally, in my navigation mesh settings, I'll tell it to look for this group and all the child nodes inside. So now Godot knows how to build the nav mesh. If you select the navigation mesh instance node, you see that there's a button in the toolbar at the top to bake the nav mesh. If you click it, you'll instantly get a blue overlay on your walkable areas with holes where there are obstacles and the path is blocked. To really tweak and adapt the nav mesh to your liking, you can use the options from the cells and agents sections in the inspector to further customize the computation. But at this point, we already have our core element. This navigation mesh is a representation of our scene as a map of walkable and non-walkable areas that we're going to give to our agents so they can compute paths to target locations. Those agents are the objects that are going to move on the map, like our ship here. In order to turn a scene into a nav mesh agent, you just need to open it and add a navigation agent node as a child of the root. In the inspector, you see that you have yet another set of parameters to play with, so feel free to test and explore the impact of each one on the movement of your agent. At this point, our project is now ready for navigation, and we can start to write some code to actually have our ship use the right-clicked position on the ground as a target, and move towards it by using our brand new map of walkable and blocked areas. Okay, it's finally time to put all of this together and use Kado's navigation built-ins to move our ship units. We're going to take care of this in the units.cs script, which is already added on the root node of the Unity subscene over here. If we open it, we see that at the moment, the script doesn't do anything. However, it's important to notice that the class inherits from the kinematic body c -sharp class, which matches the kinematic body node type of the scene root. That's because we want to move our objects in a smooth way, and kinematic bodies are a great tool to do this easily. So we're going to need to extend the script to implement our move logic, based on the clicked position in world coordinates we determined in our game manager script. Luckily, this is pretty quick and easy to do. The very first step is to cache a reference to our navigation agent node, so that we can access it multiple times to set its target location or get the next position in the computed path. Once again, I'll assign the reference in the ready function by using a direct path to the node in my local hierarchy. Then, we'll need to create a public function to allow the game manager to pass us the target location. I'll call it move2, and inside this method, I'll simply call the setTargetLocation function on my agent variable. This tells the navigation agent to use this new point as a final position and to automatically compute a path to it that takes into account the walkable and non-walkable areas of the navigation mesh in our scene. Now, to have our unit actually move along the computed path to this destination point as time goes by, let's override the physics process function. At the very beginning, we can add an early check so that if there is no path left to consume, we avoid this entire computation, cause we've already arrived. Then, the rest of the logic is quite straightforward. First, we're going to get our current position in world space coordinates by reading the global translation property of a node. This comes from our inheritance chain, since kinematic body itself inherits from spatial, and this global translation property is available for any spatial node. Then, we'll ask our navigation agent node to give us the next position in the computed path. This is not necessarily the target location itself. If the path is long and it requires turning at one point, then the next position will be this intermediate location along the way. Now we can use these positions to compute the movement direction, renormalize the result, and remultiply it by the speed of our nav agent. Note that you could of course define your own speed variable here, or input some predetermined constant, but I personally prefer to centralize everything in my agent component when possible. Anyway, at this point, we just need to call the move and slide function that we get from our kinematic body parent class, with the velocity we prepared, and it will make our object move properly. Finally, we have to go back to our game manager and actually call our units move to function, when there's a right click on the ground. 
For the sake of simplicity, in this tutorial, I'll assume my unit is already instantiated in the scene and that I have only this one and that I can simply retrieve a reference to it by writing down this path. In a real game, of course, you'd probably want to have multiple units and you'd want to implement some selection logic to know which ones need to listen to the move order and set the target location. Anyway, here we see that we have this pre-referenced unit and in the right-click logic, if we've got array intersection, we'll also call the move to function with the given position. And now if we run the game, we get some unexpected movement from a ship before even clicking anywhere. That's because by default, the agent's target position is at the origin of the scene, but our ship isn't in our case. So to avoid this initial reset of the unit's position, we need to come back to our unit script and in the ready function, use our newly assigned agent variable and set its target location to the current position of the unit in world space coordinates. This way, the agent will realize that it's actually already arrived at its destination. This is way better, we don't have this initial slide and we can now right-click on the ground to move our ship around in a smooth and clever way, with nice paths that avoid the obstacles we set in the scene. The problem, however, is that the ship doesn't actually rotate to look at its next position. Instead, it just slides sideways in a fairly unnatural way. So let's fix this. We'll go back to our unit script, and at the end of our physics process function, we'll just use the lookat method we inherit from spatial to update our ship's rotation and have it turn towards the upcoming location. Note that to avoid computation errors, it is better to ensure the distance between the transform current position and the lookat position is over a minimal threshold, so we'll wrap our lookat call into an if check with an arbitrary small value for the distance threshold. Also, as a little side note here, I'm assuming all movements are happening on the horizontal plane, which is why I'm using vector3.up here and I'm not adding any angle to the velocity direction. But if we had some slopes on our terrain to take into account, we would need to do a little raycast beneath our unit, downwards, to get the normal of the terrain surface and then reapply this normal in our computation. Anyway, there we are. If we restart the game, we see that our ship now properly computes the path to the location we clicked on the ground, looks at the next position along the route, and finally stops when it has reached the target position. And thanks to Godot's built-in navigation utilities, all of this happens smoothly and with just a few lines of code. So here you go, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned some basics to using Godot's raycasting and navigation systems to create a point-and-click move logic. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you have other ideas of Godot tricks that you'd like to learn, leave a comment down below. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.